that glorious word, faith of our Father's holy faith, we will be true to Thee till death. Faith of our Father's holy faith, we will be true to Thee. Faith of our fathers, God's great power Shall win all nations unto thee And through the truth that comes from God Mankind shall then indeed be free Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to Thee till death. Faith of our fathers, we will both friend and foe in all our strife and preach thee to as love knows how by kindly words and virtuous life faith of our father's holy faith we will be true to thee Father's holy faith, we will be true to Thee till death. Good evening. How are you tonight? Are you ready for um, Memorial Day coming up? We have some special music for Memorial Day at the very end there, you'll see. Right now, though, if you'd like to sing with me, Feed on the Rock, the Rock of Jesus. Well, I want to talk to you for a minute about an old man I met. He said, girl, you're looking troubled, and I bet your life is a mess. He said, I used to have the same problem. It's way out of control. You know, the only thing that set it right for me was a little good old rock and roll. Oh, 
is what we really need to this is what we really need to listen to and want to get to this place I give him my heart I give him my soul I want to honor him I don't want it to be I don't want it to be me and Deanna I don't want it to be flesh I want it to be spirit, and that's all, his spirit. We must worship him in spirit and in truth, not in the flesh. Let's do it. Desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. Yeah. 
finally figured that out. You just kind of have to hush up, totally give yourself to him. I can't do no more, Lord. You got to do it. He'll come through. He does. Would you stand for this new song? It's new to us anyway. can speak to the mountains, you know.
beloved hour when giants come calling my name. My God, He's so much bigger than the troubles I face. Why would I hunger for power or riches or fame? My God is so much better than all of those things. So I won't be shaken. I won't be moved. For my God is faithful. His promise is true. So I speak to the mountains. Oh, it's time to move. God is bigger, better, stronger. He's greater than you. My enemies scatter because they know the battle is done. My God is stronger. The victory's already won. He died for my ransom and rose up on the third day my god is greater than death hell and a grave so i won't be shaken no i won't be moved because my god is faithful his promise is true I speak to the mountains It's time for you to move Cause my God is bigger, better, stronger He's greater than you no mountain too high, no valley too low. There's no fear that I have, he doesn't already know. There's no problem too big, no weapon too strong. There is nothing for God, it's impossible. There's no mountain too high, no valley too low. There's no fear that I have, he doesn't already know. There's no problem too big, no weapon too there is nothing for God, it's impossible I won't be shaken, no I won't be moved For my God is faithful and His promise is true So I speak to the mountains time for you to move Cause my God is bigger better, stronger and greater bigger, better, stronger and greater He's bigger, better, stronger and greater He's bigger, better, stronger He's greater than you Guess what? It's a threesome. Toby is joining us. I love it when he does. Ready. Have a seat if you want. 
Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weary? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feet? Cause shame's done all the steel. And you're desperate for some heat. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Cause he makes a way when there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't say. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, his love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah, 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 amen, amen, amen. Who can wipe away the tears from broken dreams and wasted years and tell the past to disappear? Oh, and let me tell you about my Jesus and the good things that could undo if you could Who could work it all for you good Let me tell you about my Jesus Well, he makes a way where there ain't no way Rises up from an empty grave Ain't no sinner that he can say Let me tell you about my Jesus When his love is strong and his grace is free And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Who would take my cross to Calvary, pay the price for all my guilty? Who would care that much about me? Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, well, it makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't say. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Well, His love is strong and His grace is free And the good news is I know that He can do for you what He's done for me Let me tell you about my Jesus Let my Jesus change your life Hallelujah 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 Hallelujah, 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 let my Jesus change your This one you got to stand up for now. You remember God bless the U.S. Sing it with me. If tomorrow all the things were gone, you worked for all your life, and you had to start again with just your children, well, I thank my lucky stars to be living here today Cause the flag still stands for freedom and they can't take that away And I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the man who died who gave that right to me Next to you and the thin still today. Cause 
there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA From the lakes of Minnesota To the hills of Tennessee Across the plains of Texas From sea to shining sea From Detroit down to Houston New York to LA There's pride in every American heart And it's time we stand and say Sing it with me And I'm proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died Who gave that right to me And I gladly stand up still today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA And I'm proud, proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the man who died Who gave that right to me And I'll gladly stand There ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA it, what it stood for, what it meant. Father, only you can get us back to that point, because man cannot do it. Only you can do it, Father. So we pray for our country, Lord, and we pray for all those men and women that died risking their lives to give us what we have, Lord. Remember, Remember, we got to fight, y'all. We can't just stand by and let it go. Because the Lord is on our side. We thank you, Father. We thank you for this wonderful holiday. We thank you for all these men and women. We give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if we can make our way back to our seats, we'll get started here tonight. Good to see everyone. Hope everyone is enjoying another beautiful sunny day. I don't think I can get enough of that sun. feels very good. 
But uh, anyways, thank you, Lana and Deanna and Toby, for the worship. As Toby said, a wonderful time of worship. Um, God bless the USA. Not a bad way to, to end things for sure. As, uh, it's Memorial Day this coming Monday, so we'll see. Maybe Sunday we'll have an appropriate message for Memorial Day. But with that, if you uh, brought your Bibles with you here tonight and you'd like to open them with me, we are going to be looking at Exodus chapter 29 tonight as we um, kind of skipped chapter 27. And so we did chapter 28 two weeks ago. Then Andy reminded me I skipped chapter 27. So we did 27 last week. But now we're back on the right track as we're going to be looking at uh, Exodus 29. And I think a very uh, important chapter in a very timely chapter because God again is saved his people, redeemed them from the slavery there in Egypt and he's leading them now out into the wilderness and he begins to give Moses the plans for this tabernacle the place where God was going to dwell with his people, where the people could come to meet with God, where God's very presence would be there amongst his people. And now he's, remember, setting aside the priest. He's calling um, Aaron and his sons and calling them as the first priest, which would continue through the family of Levi, the Levites. And now he's getting into... uh, the office of the priest, and why this is so important to you and I is because of what Peter told us, uh, that we are now a royal priesthood, even you and I here today, that in Christ Jesus, we are a royal priesthood. And so as we look at how these priests are consecrated unto God, it's the same way that you and I are consecrated before God. And what's amazing about this first work of consecration here, the ceremony of these priests being consecrated, is you're going to see this consecration is a work of God. It all involves God's doing. And then what we'll see uh, through the beautiful picture here, that once there's this initial ceremony of consecration, that God consecrates the priests. God sets them apart. God makes them holy. Once that initial process is done, for you and I, we may say once we are saved and we are born again and filled with the Spirit, then we don't need to be re-saved all the time. Just like the priest, this initial consecration was only done once. The first time he stepped up into the office of priest, there was this initial ceremony. Then after this initial ceremony, as the priest would come to the tabernacle to perform his duties, he didn't have to wash his whole body like, uh, or have somebody wash his whole body like they had to the first time. Now they would only do what? Wash their hands and wash their feet. And so beautiful pictures, guys, because God is the one who makes us holy. God is the one who consecrates us initially. And then once we are consecrated, we are made holy then you and I have a responsibility to then consecrate ourselves. I think a lot of people, when you talk about consecration, uh, they get it mixed up with the Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow is a different form of consecration. This consecration is only for the priest. Uh, In the days uh, of the old days of the Old Testament, anyone can take a Nazarite vow. Any old person could say, I want to consecrate myself to God and do this and do this and take that vow. This is different. This ceremony of consecration was only for the priest. And so it's so similar to our relationship with God now as we are a royal priesthood and how we are consecrated before God. And so let's pray here tonight and we'll get into the study in Exodus chapter 29. Father in heaven, thank you, God, for... This day, God, and I thank you so much for the sun. I'm uh, just was counting the days today, and we're almost into June. So June, July, August, and then already in September, it's going to start getting cool again. So I'm looking forward to uh, these three months or so of, uh, I pray, warmth and sun, God, and um, how we need it. 
And so, uh, Father, I just thank you. I thank you for all things. I thank you for each and every one who is here tonight, God. And I do pray, as we approach your word, God, that we would approach your word as a consecrated people. Lord, that we would approach your word with all humility. uh, As we're going to see these beautiful pictures, God, of sacrifice and fellowship. That is what consecration is all about. In order for us to be consecrated, it involves sacrifice and fellowship. And we can't have fellowship without these first very critical steps of sacrifice. In order for us to be consecrated unto you. And so, Father, I pray that you would speak to us here tonight, that you would encourage us, Lord, you would strengthen us, Lord, you would shore up the things that need to be shored up, Lord, you would work on the things that you're continuing to work on, you would show us all grace and mercy, God, and forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness as we draw unto you. And so bless your church, bless your people, and bless your word, and we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen. And so Exodus chapter 29, beginning at verse 1, says, Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them to minister as priests to me. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread and unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers spread with oil. You shall make them a fine wheat flour You shall put them in one basket and present them in the basket along with the bull and the two rams. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent of meeting or the tabernacle and wash them there. Verse 5, you shall take the garments and put on Aaron the tunic and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastpiece and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. Then you shall take the anointing oil, I love that, and pour it on his head and anoint him. You shall bring his sons and put tunics on them. You shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and bind caps on them. And they shall have the priesthood by a perpetual statue So you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. And so again, what is God doing? After last week, we looked at God telling the people, the skillful people, how to make these garments for the priest. Uh, And now God is saying, now it's time to consecrate these priests. It's time to set them apart or to make them holy. The word could actually be hallowed or make them holy. Uh, And this is what is happening here, a beautiful picture of this consecration. And so what is it here is really these instructions. What we see in this chapter is God giving the instructions on how to consecrate the priest. If you want to actually read through the ceremony that took place, you can find that in Leviticus 8, where they took these instructions and you can read about how they actually did everything that God says here to do. That's in Leviticus 8. And so the first thing God says is he says, get one young bull and two rams, or rams are male sheep the last time I checked. So grab a bull and two rams and some unleavened bread and some cakes and some oil and a basket. And so right away, uh, this consecration process, what we see is what is going to be required to consecrate these priests who are being consecrated to be priests unto God. Remember that. Even you and I, our first responsibility is not necessarily to one another. Our first responsibility is to God. And then with that responsibility intact with God, then we can have the relationship with one another. And so same thing here. God says, bring these uh, bull, this bull and these rams and this bread. And really you see the picture here of sacrifice. Because all of these animals, these three animals, are all going to be given as sacrifices. So the first thing that we need to understand about consecration, even for us, for us to be set apart or to be made holy, it requires a sacrifice. Who is our sacrifice that makes us holy? It's Jesus. 
So here, these animals being sacrificed is the same picture of what Jesus did. In order for you and I to be holy before God, it requires a sacrifice, just like here. And the bread. Uh, Remember, bread is always a symbol of fellowship. When we talked about the table of showbread, how the 12 loaves were there on the table representing the 12 tribes of Israel. But then remember, on the seventh day, the priest was to go in there, take those old loaves off, put new ones on. And then what did the priest do with those old loaves? He ate the bread. A picture, even with the table and the bread and the eating of the bread, it's always speaking of fellowship. So here in consecration, for you and I to be consecrated to God, there needs to be a sacrifice and there needs to be fellowship. And so this is what the bread and the three animals represent. And so this consecration, I'll tell you guys, it cannot happen without sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, you and I could never be consecrated. And also, um, without the fellowship, we cannot be consecrated either. And so it requires sacrifice and fellowship. And so then what does he say? After you get the bull and the two rams and the bread and the basket and the oil, now he says in verse 4, Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Think about what the Bible is saying here. Bring these priests who God has ordained them, right? He said Aaron and his sons. God picked them, right? Just like God picks us. God calls us. But he says bring them to the door of the tent way, of the tent of meeting or the door of the tabernacle. Isn't it amazing that God doesn't say come on in to the tabernacle and I'll make you holy there. God says no, bring them to the door of the tabernacle. And what does he say to do at the door? Notice that it says, you wash them. This is fascinating. And think about what that means. Uh, You know, has anyone ever been in the hospital and had the humiliating act of having a nurse have to sponge bathe you? How humiliating that is to have somebody else wash you when you can't wash yourself? This is the picture here. These priests were taken to the door of the tent of meeting. May I say, they weren't even in privacy. (laughs) They were out and open before everyone to see, and everyone has seen them being washed by somebody else. See, guys, this is how we are consecrated before the Lord. We have to come humbly before God. We can't wash ourselves. Oh, how we have tried, maybe, and tried to wash that sin away, and it just does not happen. Why? Because we cannot wash ourselves. God has to wash us, and how amazing we see that right here in the Old Testament. When God is consecrating his priest, he says, you bring them, and you bathe them in front of everybody. And so here's another part of consecration for you and I. We can't consecrate ourselves. We can't wash ourselves. God has to wash us, and we have to be humble. Doesn't the Bible say something about God will exalt the humble, but he resists the proud? Well, we can't even be consecrated unless we are humble before God and we allow him to wash us. And so he says, bring them to the door of the tent of meeting. And and I'll tell you this, we know this, anyone who's in ministry which just means service to God, you can't serve God without being consecrated. You can't serve God without being humble and letting God begin to wash you. Every form of service requires you and I to be consecrated before God. And so this cleansing, again, is done by somebody else just like our cleansing. We don't wash away our own sin. Jesus washes away our sin. And we cannot be cleansed without being humbled, just like the picture here. And so this great cleansing, as I said at the beginning, this was the only time the priest had to go through this ceremony was his first time being consecrated where he was brought publicly there and, and he, you know, humbled and, and, and bathed fully Even in Jesus' day, we know the priests just had to wash their hands and wash their feet. And so how symbolic is that for you and I? We can't consecrate ourselves. God has to consecrate us, especially that first time. 
And then after that, what are we responsible to do? Well, we have to keep the vessel clean. Right? We have to then wash our hands and wash our feet. In fact, what is the washing with the water a picture of? The word of God. You see, Ephesians 5.26, Paul commands the husbands in the marriage to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And he sanctified her by what? The washing of the water of the word. That she was then going to be presented before God spotless and without blemish. And so what a beautiful picture for us to be consecrated. The washing here is a picture of the word washing us. Allowing the word to wash us. And that also requires humility. That we have to submit ourselves to the word of God. We have to allow ourselves to be washed by the word of God. And I love what John 15, 3 says. Jesus says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And so the word has this cleansing and washing effect, though it is only part of the washing. We're going to see here the atonement is also very important for the washing. But here, very clearly, the word being involved. The washing of the water of the word. In fact, in John 13, 9 is that beautiful illustration of Jesus doing what? Washing their feet, right? And that's when Peter said, oh, no, 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 you're not washing my feet. And I, again, give Peter the benefit of the doubt. You know, I think Peter probably understood that he messed up earlier in not washing Jesus' feet as he came in the door. And now Jesus is here washing Peter's feet. And I think, you know, I don't want to think too far into it. I don't know Peter's mind, but I think I'll give Peter the benefit of the doubt. And Peter was just like, no way, you're the Lord of Lords. You don't need to wash my feet. But what did Jesus say? If you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part with me. And then Peter, it clicked. And so then what did Peter say? Well, then bathe my whole body like that initial consecration. Right? He said, bathe my whole body. And what did Jesus say? No, 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 no. My word has already made you clean. Just your feet need to be washed. This is the picture we see here. The same thing, that initial washing, consecration of God happened to the priest. Then after that, they had to do what? They had to keep coming to Jesus, in a sense, and letting Jesus wash their feet. That's what you and I are responsible to do. And so, amazing, Revelation 1.5 talks about the cleansing work uh, that happened for us through Jesus Christ that we receive by Faith. This is all part of the washing, the consecration that God does for you and I. And so verse 5, he says, After you wash the priest, says you shall take the garments and put on Aaron the tunic and the robe and the ephod and the ephod's breast piece and gird him with the skillfully woven band to the ephod and you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. So look at the order here. First, they had to do what? It was just the priests. They were called to the door of the tent way where then somebody else washed them. Now, after they have been washed by the word, now those garments that God instructed other people to make. I love that. The priests didn't make their own garments. The priests didn't even pay for their own garments they were garments that God had supplied for them, and then the priest couldn't even put them on them himself. Have you ever had to have yourself be dressed? That takes a certain amount of humility as well, doesn't it? This is the picture here. God washes us, and then God clothes us. God provides the clothes, and God puts them on. You and I can't put them on. Revelation 3, 5, how ironic. The Bible says that we are now robed in Christ Jesus' righteousness. Robes that we didn't buy, that we didn't work for, that were supplied to us at a very expensive price. God gave his son on the cross to die for the sins so that we can have those robes now 
given to us. And so any robes we try to put on ourselves, the Bible says those good works of trying to put on these nice robes, the Bible calls them filthy rags, right? You think about what Adam and Eve did when they sinned. What was the first thing they tried to do? Clothe themselves. Did that work very well? No, it didn't. They were still ashamed when God called them. And what did God have to do? He killed an animal. Something had to die because of their sin. And then God took the skin from that animal. And then God clothed them. God covered them. What an amazing, amazing picture that God washes us through his word. Then God robes us in his righteousness uh, that we're not done by any of the effort of the priest. All he had to do was stand there and let people wash him and clothe him and be humble. And so Jesus, again, he provided these robes that are free to you and I. Oh, how free and sweet they are indeed, but what a price they came with. God giving his own son and Jesus being willing to lay down his life for a bunch of people, some of them, the majority of them, who would even still reject him. Right? It's not like he just died and knew that everyone would come to faith in him. That might be worth it, right? But to die into the hands of evil men so that people will still spit in your face. Amazing, the sacrifice that Jesus made. And so verse 7, now we have the washing, the clothing. Verse 7, I love this. Then you shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. And then you shall bring his sons and put tunics on them. You shall gird them with the sashes, Aaron and his sons, and bind the caps on them, and they shall be the priests by the perpetual state. So you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. I love this because there's a washing, there's a clothing, and now there's an anointing. Oil in the Bible always is a reference to the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we have anointing oil here, and we'll anoint people because the Bible tells us to, right? Those who are sick come before the elders and the elders can lay hands and anoint you with oil. But you know what? If you come up here for prayer, I'm going to dab my finger in the oil and put it on your forehead. This isn't the kind of consecration that is being spoken of here. Uh, the picture is, remember the scripture says Aaron was anointed with his head and it was dripping down his beard. Uh, let me say it was not just a dab of oil here. Uh, they poured the oil out on their head. And full supply of the oil, which is a picture of and a type of the Holy Spirit. So once we are washed and then we are robed, then we are anointed with the Holy Spirit. And it's not just a little teaspoon. The picture is that it is no small measure. It is an outpouring of God's Spirit. First John 2.20 says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One. Right? God anoints us with his Holy Spirit. Once we are washed and clothed, then we are anointed by the Spirit. And so I love this. Now we see the priest uh, almost ready for service, almost ready for this consecration. But there's some very important parts to go. Because as I said, there is this washing, the first part of the washing through the word. But now we're going to see the other part of the washing, which is the atoning for. This is what is going to complete the consecration. And so, uh, what does he say here in verse 10? This is the first offering, the first sacrifice. It's the sin offering. It says, Then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting, and Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. You shall slaughter the bull before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting, you shall take some of the blood and of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your fingers and you shall pour out all the blood at the base of the altar. You shall take all of the fat, the covers, the entrails and the lobe of the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them and offer them up in smoke on the altar. Remember, that's the bronze altar we looked at last week. But the flesh of the bull and its hind and its refuse you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. And so God says now after the priest has been washed and he's been clothed and he's been anointed, now you bring the bull. Uh, what was it? One young bull and two 
rams. And so now first start with this young bull. This is the sin offering. And bring it here before the door of the tent of meeting. Remember the bronze altar or the killing place. Bring it to the killing place. And what are we going to do now? Well, this is part of that washing and consecration process. Because not only do we need to be washed by the word, but this first sin offering really is uh, the wages of sin is death. And so there, this is the punishment for sin now. Sin has to be dealt with. And this is what we see here. Part of the consecration process isn't just being washed with the word. Uh, there needs to be this death for the guilty. And that's what is going to be symbolic through this sin offering. Uh, and notice that the priest did what to the bull? They would place their hands on its head. And so really the picture here is, is you're placing your hand on that bull's head. And what they would do is they would begin to confess their sins to God. And the picture is those sins that they have committed is now being transferred to that bull who is going to be sacrificed. And as that bull's life is taken, that life of the bull is now extended back to you. In other words, your sin is being atoned for. And so how amazing, because don't we have to kind of reach our hand out to Jesus? right? Don't we have to exercise faith in Jesus in order to have our sins put on him and then receive the life back from Jesus? Absolutely we do. And so we can only be consecrated, guys, through the washing and the humility. And here now we see through this sacrifice. And so uh, our consecration should be so much greater, right? Our sacrifice should be so much greater knowing just how much God gave for you and I. God didn't withhold anything but his best, his only begotten son on our behalf. So how much more now should I be compelled and willing to consecrate myself, to give myself to God, uh, lay those dead things on Christ and receive back from him his life? It's an exchange. Uh, it's a beautiful Beautiful thing. And so as you put your hand there, you're confessing your sins, then sacrifice the animal, kill it, shed its blood. We know the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. That's how it becomes the atonement. And then what do you do with that blood? You take that blood, you put it on the horns of the altar. So in other words, you're sanctifying that altar now. Put the rest of the blood there at the foot of the altar. And I love verse 13 here. That says, now you have this bull, right? And it's killed. Uh, God says, now divvy it up, right? Uh, take what I would call the good parts, right? The kidneys and all these organs, all these uh, other parts, the fat. And God says, burn that to me. Give that part to me. Now the hind and all the other stuff, take that outside of the camp and destroy it, right? This is the sin offering, and so always with all three of these sacrifices, you see God taking the best part of this sacrifice. And that is so important because remember, Jesus is the Lamb of God who was slain for us. Jesus had everything perfect in him. He was perfect and sinless. And so he gave that perfect part to God to appease God's law so that he can then transfer that perfect life back to you and I. And our sins are what? Are taken outside of the camp and destroyed or forgotten as far as the east is to the west to never be remembered again. And so I love that, that God says, Burn the best part, bring it back up to me like a sweet savoring aroma rising before me. All the hind and all the garbage, take it outside the camp and burn that. So this is the sin offering. And really what the sin offering is saying as the priest is doing all of this, he's saying we have failed in giving our best to God. Because you and I aren't perfect like Jesus was. Right? So we have failed in offering our best or perfection to God where Jesus did not fail, but Jesus gave that life so that we could then have his life given to us. And so what an amazing thing. This is the atonement. And when we say we have failed in giving God our best, the animal atones for that. And we actually take the best of the animal or the best of Jesus 
back. Jesus is life, right? We crucify ourselves with Christ and we are crucified with him, but then we are also resurrected with him, right? He takes away the worst and he gives us the best. I mean, what an exchange. What a good deal we got when we came to Jesus. And so the animal not only gave its best on behalf of the person, or Jesus gave his best, but remember the animal died, <laughs> The animal died in our place, which is exactly what Jesus did. He didn't just give us his best. He died to give us our best, just like this animal here. And so verse 15, this is the second sacrifice, which is the burnt offering. Verse 15 says, You shall also take the one ram, and Aaron his son shall lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall slaughter the ram and shall take its blood and sprinkle it around the altar. Then you shall cut the ram into its pieces and wash its entrails, its legs, and put them with its pieces and its head. You shall offer up in smoke the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a soothing aroma, an offering by fire to the Lord. So here's the second offering now, the first of the rams. The bull's already the sin offering. Now take one of those rams, bring it before the altar. Notice he says, do the same thing you did on the sin offering, on the bull. Have the priest put his hand there, and it's the same thing. The transferring of the sins, the confessing of the sins uh, on that animal, and then kill the animal, cut it up, do what? Take all of the good parts again and burn it. Or I'm sorry, not just the good parts. Take the whole animal. Take all of it now after you divvy it up. Put it on the altar there and burn the whole thing as a burnt offering to me. And so amazing that this animal, the whole thing was burnt before God. Uh, after the blood was sprinkled there on the altar. Again, another cleansing and sanctifying uh, the blood, the life is in the blood, is what Leviticus 17.11 says. The life of the flesh is in the blood. That's why the blood is so important, especially the blood of Jesus, because that's the life we get in exchange when his life was shed, his blood was shed. And so it's also, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. And so this burnt offering of the whole ram basically is saying that we have failed in giving are all to God because it was the whole animal. And so you and I who fall short, the Bible says that there is no one good. There is no one righteous before God. All have sinned and fallen short of his glory. We failed in giving our all to God. The only one who could was Jesus, and he did. Uh, so he, in a way, is this burnt offering as well, you know, that we are to now... Uh, um, exchange the, the areas and the parts where we have missed. Uh, and when we give that to Jesus, we receive his life. We receive everything that he has accomplished because God now sees us. He no longer sees you and I. He sees Christ when he sees us, when we are in Christ, when we are consecrated, when God has consecrated us. Not we try to consecrate ourselves. Uh, when we come before God and we allow God to consecrate us. And so uh, the animal uh, tones once again for our failures and he gives us his life in exchange. That's what the blood is. And so verse 19, uh, this is the third offering, says, Then you shall take the other ram, and Aaron his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. You shall slaughter the ram and take some of the blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear and on the lobes of the sun's right ears, and on the thumbs of the right hands, and on the big toes of their right feet, and sprinkle the rest of the blood around the altar. Verse 21 says, Then you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil, and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments and on his sons and on his son's garments with him so he and his garments shall be consecrated as well as his um, as his sons and his son's garments with him and so now this is the third offering or the second ram 
And God says uh, to bring the ram there to the altar. Again, the priest does the same thing. All three offerings, right? Extends the hand onto the head, confesses the sins. The sins are transferred. The life is received in return. Now notice with this one, though, the blood of this animal, God commanded them to take some of the blood and put it on the right ear, the right finger, and the right toe of the priest. This was the first step. And I think this is amazing to me because God is now consecrating their bodies, right? I mean, think about that. You know, when God consecrates us, uh, hopefully when he touches our ear and we apply some of his blood to our ear, maybe we hear things differently. (laughs) Maybe we're able to hear. We're no longer deaf, right? When God's blood touches our hand and consecrate our hands, maybe our work as unto the Lord is a little more consecrated. Maybe when he touches our feet and the blood touches our feet and our feet are consecrated, maybe we will walk a little differently. And so I think with the blood and God specifically saying, take some of the blood and actually touch it on your skin. Uh, some translation even said it's, it's making a mess. It's not just a little dab. It's, it's soaking these fingers and the ear and the toe And I think God wants us to identify. That's the point there. You need to identify with this sacrifice. Isn't that what God says that we're supposed to do with Jesus? That Jesus identifies with us so that we can then identify ourselves in him. That we need to identify ourselves with him. That he is our what? We are imitators of him. That we are to be Christ-like. This is the picture. That he wanted his priests to identify with this uh, sacrifice and apply this blood. And so again, a Leviticus, Leviticus 17, 11, uh, tells us that the life of the flesh is in the blood. So these priests were marked with the blood. Uh, they should hear, work, and walk a lot differently once they are consecrated by God. We've been kind of looking through that through Ephesians, uh, that we are saved by grace through faith, uh, not by works, lest anyone, any man boast, but then we are also now created new as workmanship unto God, that there now will be these good works that you and I perform after we have been consecrated by God, after we have been washed and clothed and anointed and accepted the sacrifice and atoned for our sin. What a beautiful thing, then, that you and I are going to walk different. We are now consecrated and It's no coincidence that it's the right side. That's always speaking of the authority, right? The superior side, the right hand, right? Jesus, where's Jesus sitting? At the right hand of the Father. And so just the right side isn't because God is right-handed and biased to the left. It's because it speaks of authority and superiority, just as Jesus is sitting at the right hand. But now he says in verse 21, fascinating here, Take some more of the oil, he says in verse 21, and the blood. Then you you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments and on his son's garments with him. So he and his garments shall be consecrated as well as his son's and his son's garments with him. So now God says, take some of the blood from the altar from this third animal, the same animal that you put the blood on the ear and on the finger and on the toe, now take some of that and mix it. This is fascinating. Mix it in with the anointing oil and do what? Sprinkle it now on the priest and on their clothes. And what a powerful, powerful picture I think this is that really it's not just the blood that consecrates us. God's saying here, mix the blood with The oil, what is the oil representing? The Holy Spirit. So now God is saying it's going to be the blood and the Spirit having its part in our consecration. God wants the blood mixed with the oil. And so what a combination of the sacrifice of Jesus, the shedding of his blood, and oh yeah, the Holy Spirit as well. So it's both. For us to be consecrated, it's going to take the sacrifice of Jesus along with the Holy Spirit. And so what an amazing thing. You may say Jesus' blood cleanses us, 
But the Holy Spirit is the one who, I love this, perfumes us. Right, that we are now a sweet-smelling aroma unto God. And to those who are perishing, we're an aroma as well. But we're an aroma of death to those who are perishing. And so amazing here, we see the Spirit, we see Jesus, we see sacrifice in the Spirit. We know that it takes, because who is it once we uh, are washed, once we are clothed, once we are anointed, once there is atonement made? Isn't it the Holy Spirit now that comes and lives within us? So we need the sacrificial work of Jesus and we need the anointing and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And so verse 22, he says, You shall also take the fat from the ram and the fat tail and the fat that covers the entrails and the lobe of the liver and the two kidneys and all the fat that is on them and the right thigh, for it is a ram of ordination." And take one cake of bread and one cake of bread mixed with oil and one wafer from the basket of unleavened bread, which is set before the Lord. Verse 24. And you shall put all these in the hands of Aaron, in the hands of his sons, and shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. You shall take them from their hands and offer them up in smoke on the altar of the burnt offering for a soothing aroma before the Lord. It is an offering by fire to the Lord. So after you take some of the blood from this ram and put it on the ear, the finger, the toe, you mix it with the oil and you slush it all over the priest. Now he says you take all of these good parts and you take one of the cakes, one of the bread, you put them in the basket and you bring it before the altar and you offer all of that up unto the Lord. And so a sweet, savoring aroma. But notice he also says before you do that, put it in Aaron's hands and they are to do a wave offering. Uh, really, it's a peace offering. Before they sacrifice it or before they burn it there on the altar, they're to wave it before the Lord. Then they place it there on the altar and they ignite it. And so again, it's the best parts of the animal with the bread uh, and the oil and it's being waved and given to God. I think this is a beautiful picture in the consecration process of devotion to God. right? A full devotion to God. God. But look what he does also here. This is where we close verse, well, we're, we close at verse 30, but we're winding down. Verse 26 says, Then you shall take the breast of Aaron's ram of ordination and wave it as a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your portion. You shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the heave offering, which was waved and which was offered. For the ram of ordination from the one which was from Aaron and from one which was from his sons. It shall be for Aaron and his sons and their portion forever from the sons of Israel. For it is a heave offering and it shall be a heave offering from the sons of Israel. From the sacrifices of their peace offerings, even their heave offerings to the Lord. So now that third animal after all the good stuff and some of the bread was waved before the Lord, put on the altar, offered as a burnt offering unto the Lord. Now he says, take some of the remaining parts of the meat and do what? That is what you are going to give to the priest. And so as they would wave this before the Lord, then the picture is they would take this meat, the priest would, and they'd barbecue it. I love this part. They'd barbecue the meat. I haven't eaten dinner yet. I'm sorry. Nothing like talking about, you know, burnt meat when you're hungry. But the priest now, remember, we're all priests, right? So the priest now would take the rest of this meat and they would barbecue it. And fascinating, to conclude the consecration part, uh, it took seven days, which we're going to read here. They had to go for seven days now off of this meat and they would go into the tabernacle now. And there they would eat the remainder of the bread and the remainder of this good meat and they would eat there in the tabernacle with God for seven days. That is what would conclude their consecration process. And I love that. Uh, that the fellowship and the picture of the fellowship with God after you've been washed, after you've been robed, after you've been anointed, after you've been atoned for. Right? Then what? Now God says, come and fellowship with me. Come now into the tabernacle. 
and eat with me and fellowship with me. But the eating comes after the clothing, after the washing, after the atonement. So many people want fellowship with God, but they're unwilling to be washed by God. They're unwilling to be clothed by God. They're unwilling to accept the atoning sacrifice that God offered. Because all of that requires what? Humility. It calls us to say, you know what? I, I can't do this. God has to do it for me. Then God says, come and eat with me. And see the parallel between Ephesians and this part here? Because remember, we looked at last week, the Bible says that before we are consecrated, God consecrates us or saves us, that we are what? Dead in our sins and trespasses, right? That we can't, a dead man can't believe, a dead man can't repent until God has some work going on in us, right? It's God's grace. Well, here you see the exact same thing. A dead man uh, here. Um, this dead man first had to be washed, right? He first had to be clothed before he could then have fellowship with God. And so the eating of the sacrifice, I find this fascinating, didn't give life to the dead man, right? All it does is sustains the life that had already been given to him. So we need to get that in the right order, right? We're saved by grace through faith. And then when we fellowship with God, it's only because we've already went through the process of being consecrated to God, that we've already received the life. Now we can have fellowship with God. And so really, it's a picture of God sustaining the life that has now been given to you and I. And Christ, what does he do? Well, he makes us alive because we were dead in our trespasses and sins until what? We believed, we've been looking at all this, but it's a work of God because God even gives us the ability, the gift of faith, right? But we still have to do the act of believing. And so Christ made us alive, uh, but we must still feed ourselves. This is the picture here. The priests went in there and they were feeding upon God. And so though God has saved us and cleansed us and made us holy, boy, how we need to stay in his word. We have to continue to have a personal relationship with God. Think about this. The priest couldn't take that meat in there and have somebody else eat the meat for him. It's personal. The priest had to take of the bread himself, take of the meat himself. And also, it wasn't enough for the priest to take the meat and rub it on his leg. That wasn't going to accomplish anything. It has to be consumed. God's word can't just be superficial to us. God's word needs to penetrate into us. God's work needs to have an inward work in our lives. Didn't Jesus talk about that? God is concerned about the heart, the inward work. God is concerned about the motivations behind the things we do. This is the picture of being consecrated to God, that God consecrates us, but now you and I have to do what? We have to take it in. God's word, we have to feed upon God's word, and when we feed upon it, it should begin to work within us. And that is the picture here. And so it doesn't do us any good to just take this uh, meat and this bread and uh, have somebody else eat it for us or just rub it all over our bodies. We have to do it for ourselves and we have to consume it. It has to be eaten. Remember, Jesus even tells us when we celebrate communion, what does he say? Take, this is my body, right? Eat of my flesh. Eat of my body. That's what it's speaking of. You and I having fellowship with God. Well, we have to be consecrated before we can have fellowship with God. People want to be filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, but you have to be consecrated to God before we can be filled and empowered with the Spirit. And that is a work that only God can do. We just have the part of being humble and coming to Him as dead in our sins and trespasses. And what a beautiful thing. Verse 29 says, The holy garments on Aaron shall be for his sons after him, that in them they may have anointed, they may be anointed and ordained. Here you go, verse 30. For seven days, uh, 
For seven days the one of his sons who is priest in his stead shall put them on when he enters the tent of meeting to minister in the holy place. Let's read one more section. I'm sorry. For you shall take the ram of ordination, boil its flesh in the holy place. Aaron and his son shall eat of the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Thus they shall eat those things by which atonement was made at their ordination and consecration. But a layman shall not eat them because they are holy. If any of the flesh of ordination or of any of the bread remains until morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. And so only the priest, right, could go through this ordination or this, well, ordination, but this consecration process and then have fellowship with God. It was only the priest who could eat the meat and eat the bread. You and I are the priest not the layman. People who don't want to be consecrated by God can't have fellowship with God. It's only the priest who can then eat of this meat and this bread. And so the layman could not eat the meat or the bread that was used in the consecration process. And really, what a beautiful thing this is to you and I, because at one time, we were laymen, right? Until God is the one who made us high priest or priest, and so we now have a right to receive this same consecration. We can now have fellowship with God. We can now eat with God. 1 Peter 2.9 says that, that we are now a royal priesthood, that God has made us priests, right? The same way he made these priests. When we come to Jesus, right, we receive Jesus, right? And what does he do? He fills us with his spirit and we begin to repent and we begin to now walk in the things of God. We begin to have fellowship with God. We begin to eat his word, which has a cleansing and washing effect. We have to keep doing that. We need to confess our sins when we sin. And the Bible says when we confess those sins, uh, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us so we can continue having fellowship with God. Sin will break fellowship with God. Not being consecrated will break fellowship with God. And notice it said for seven days, this was the consecration process. That's the number of completion. But for seven days, that priest would be in there, fellowshipping with God, eating the bread and eating um, the meat. Um, you know, some people say, well, the idea of Gentiles becoming priests is just a New Testament idea. It's amazing, I actually found a place in the Old Testament that talks about you and I as Gentiles being able to become priests. You can find this in Leviticus 22 uh, at verse 10. Fascinating portion of scripture. It says, No layman, however, is to eat the holy gift, right? Which is exactly what it's talking about. The priest would take that meat in there and that was the holy consecrated animal that only the priest could eat. Here's what Leviticus is saying. No layman shall eat that meat, that gift. A sojourner with the priest or a hired man shall not eat of the holy gift, right? But look at this. But if a priest buys a slave, I love this, as his property with his money, that one may eat of it. And those who are born in his house may eat of this food. Who is the priest that paid with money for you and I? Jesus Christ. What an amazing thing. It says now you and I can eat of this bread. The person just traveling with him or, you know, the layman can't. Uh, but the one who has been purchased by the priest. What an amazing thing. That's you and I, guys. That's you and I, that we can now have this same relationship with God, that we can now be priest of God. Jesus is our high priest, and yes, he did indeed purchase us, just like Leviticus says here. And so I want to close with Hebrews chapter 5, uh, verse 1. Actually, the whole thing is a great read. So we'll just read uh, chapter 5, verse 1. It says, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed 
on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins. As for the people, so also for himself. Verse 4, And no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God. Even as Aaron was, so also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. This is God speaking. Just as he says also in another passage, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That's Psalm 110, by the way. Verse 7 says, In the days of his flesh, that's Jesus, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, amen to that, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk, and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Guys, we are priests of God. We are a royal priesthood. Right? And so what does Jesus say to us there? Well, we need to mature. We need to grow in the things of God and, and set aside the rudimentary, elementary things. Right, uh, Dealing with sin right, and living for God now. <laughs> I mean, God doesn't want us to just keep wallowing in the sin. We need to get beyond that. Not that we're, we're ever going to attain perfection on this earth, But the things that used to slow us down before, hopefully they're not still slowing us down. We're learning through these things. Through what? The practice that we have been trained now to discern. You know, we can sense things a little different now because we've made the mistakes enough. And we know what they look like and we know we don't want to go there anymore. So we're learning through practice and having our senses trained. I love that. If we're not exercising these gifts, guys, and we're not putting into practice the things that we're eating and digesting, then we're not having those senses senses trained. We're relying on what? Feeling or gut, you know, gut knee jerk reaction. How come my gut jerk knee reactions, if I said that right, are always favorable to me? Isn't that a strange thing? Right? It's because that's the way those things work, right? We need to be trained in the senses of the working of the Spirit, right? The Spirit of truth, not the Spirit of Gerald. <laughs> the Spirit of Gerald has his own way of doing things, right? We have to be humble before God, and uh, that takes effort, doesn't it? It takes humility, it takes submission, and it takes uh, perseverance and longevity. Though we get knocked down, what do we do? Well, while we're down, it's a good place. We're pretty close to the ground. We need to stay down. We need to confess those sins before God. We need to cry out for Him. And then what does God do? I love that. He is the lifter of our heads. Right? He says, look at the cross. Look at the cross. Paid in full. Paid in full. It is finished. Now get up and sin no more. Get up and strengthen. Now those senses should be heightened. The discernment should be getting sharper as we are being transformed, hopefully, 
day by day. Some days a little more, some days not so much, but hopefully over time, it is gradually becoming more like Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, God, for your word tonight, God. And thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus, who is the one who washes us. It was because of what he did there at Calvary and the shedding of his blood that we are now washed. Thank you for your word that also washes us. Thank you for clothing us now in Jesus' righteousness, robed in his righteousness. Thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I pray that our cups would be not just full, but that they would be overflowing, God. And Lord, I thank you um, for the life exchange that we each have received through Jesus. And so God, help us to continue to crucify the old man and to live to that new man, to uh, confess that we have not given you our best part, God. We've missed the mark uh, and now exchange that missing of the mark for Jesus' perfection. And What a beautiful thing, God. Just help us, God. Help us. We need you. I need you, God, daily. And so, Father, as we draw near to you, your word says you will then draw near to us. And so bless us, God. Oh, there's nothing more sweet than having good fellowship with you, God. Being consecrated and having fellowship and eating upon your word. And so, Father, bless your people. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We stand. Drive carefully. See you Sunday. Memorial Day.